There's no beating around the bush on this review. The Rolex Daytona is an incredibly well-made and well-designed watch, but the price tags seem outrageous. Is it still somehow worth that price? Now, I'm less convinced of that. I am, however, convinced that I will likely own one of these at some point in my life. But which one? But although the price may be high, I do have a great alternative that's at 10% of the retail price that I'll mention at the end of this video. Rolex has been making a chronograph watch within their range since the 1930s with three distinct eras, the four-digit Valjou era, the five-digit Zenith era, and the contemporary six-digit in-house movement era. Now, many of you know the Daytona had a rocky start as Rolex's chronograph watch, once called the Cosmograph, was released just a year after Rolex became the official timekeeper of the Daytona. The word Daytona wasn't added until 1964. Now, let's call it like it was. The product was a slow mover. Whether it was under-marketed or the manual wound function didn't mesh with the ethos of the Rolex's automatic or perpetual rotor, they were in low quantity because no one wanted them. These early four-digit references are now very collectible and extremely technical to service. They have an incredibly wide range of dial variations as well. Couple that with the high auction prices, and there's been an influx of nefarious dealers tampering with dials to get higher prices. Some examples would be adding red text to the dial to create a big red, or removing writing from the dial to make a Rolex-only dial. Now, I've never been a big chaser of text or font variants. And the grand scheme of things, many of those you don't really notice day to day, but many wealthy collectors salivate over these little rare changes, collecting rarity for the sake of rarity. In 1988, after almost 24 years of selling a slow moving watch, they upgraded it to an automatic movement, finally keeping with the ethos of the brand. The movement was borrowed from Zenith using the Alpermera movement, which was then modified. Now, most of you already know this story. The model you see here is an earlier reference from within that five-digit Zenith era. 1988 really wasn't that long ago, and they stuck with the Alpermera movement until 1999, when they made their own in-house movement. This Daytona here looks a bit different, a bit odd, compared to what you'd expect. When I first saw it, I thought I'd picked up some sort of gilt version that I wasn't aware of. Instead, what you're looking at here is a patinaed dial where the sub-registers have turned this gold color. Sometimes I look at a patina and I say, well, that's just age. You know, the word patina is used a lot. And sometimes it just means old or worn and a little damaged. This one is an example where the patina I think is very attractive and unique compared to the expectation of the white rim around the sub-registers. You can see the modern next to this version side by side, and the modern and older variant sub-registers do make a big difference on the dial, as does the bezel. To nerd out for a second, this color change is the effect of inconsistent formulation of an organic varnish called Zipan. This happens in some, but not all, of the Zenith Rolex Daytonas that were made between 1994 and 1996. Zappon lacquer is a cellulose nitrate varnish patented in 1887. It's a solvent mixture that dries to a very thin film. It has since been known to yellow occasionally with age, and it doesn't stabilize over time, so it can continue to get yellow or gold as it gets older. So these are very unique. Each dial will be slightly different, and therefore that makes it desirable. Fake Patrizzi dials are also therefore becoming increasingly common. The name of this dial type is a Patrizzi dial. The name comes from an auctioneer who discovered and featured a collection around these dials in 2005. So why is the Daytona so hyped? How did it rise from the ashes in the late 80s? And I believe it has a lot to do with size more than anything. Before 1988, the Cosmograph was 37 millimeters. When it changed in 1988, it grew to 40 millimeters. See, functionality and wearability got better. It's easier to read the subdials on a chronograph that's larger. Plus, 40 millimeters tends to be a sweet spot for chronographs. That plus it keeping the oyster and perpetual ethos of Rolex, I believe, helped early sales. See, wearability is crucial. This Zenith Patrizzi dial, for example, this thing wears like many Rolex models of this era wore. For my six and three quarter inch wrist with the flat top that I have, the sizing couldn't be any more comfortable. It balances well. The bracelet is a bit light because it features the folded clasp and hollow links. It's still functional though. 
See, this specific example is beautiful and well-preserved, with the crown on the bottom of the bracelet is still very visible. It has a very snappy chronograph feeling, but this still has the same problem many of the steel bezel variations have for me, which is that the steel kind of makes the text disappear. And so in certain light, it just looks like a large bezel, like without any detail to it. And so then the bezel sort of blends right into the rest of the watch, the lugs and the bracelet. You see, I like bezels that are more distinct as it helps frame the dial of the watch. This one specifically is not my favorite in person, depending on the angle. Some angles looks great, some angles I really couldn't care less about it. While the images look great and some of these images here look great, it is different sometimes, most of the time in person because the polished bezel here with this text that looks like the paint has been lost a little bit makes it really hard to read at times. Especially compare that to the modern example here. When you look from one to the next, it's hard not to be a fan of the black bezel around the exterior. I think it's an improvement on the design rather than just modernization of the materials from steel to ceramic. Now, as we look at the modern variant here, wearability continues to be a strong point for the modern Daytona as well. While I believe the modern one has a better movement, a better dial and a better bezel design, the one thing that I love that stays the same is the sizing. It's heavier and that's mainly because of the bracelet, but it retains that same 40 millimeter case. It retains the same curved edge on the side of the case, more similar to an Oyster Perpetual or a Datejust or an Explorer. And I think that helps it wear so well. It feels slim, it feels compact, it's well proportioned aesthetically. It's a fantastic watch. And frankly, I was surprised at how much I liked it on my wrist, but it does have its downsides. Downside one is the price is insane. This modern version here is being sold for $28,000 and the Patrizzi dial is being sold for $32,000. Even if you love the watch, buying one at retail for 15,000 is difficult. And then knowing that you can double your money as soon as you walk out, I think is too tempting for most people not to do so. So it continues to have the same issue of high resale values. And that end secondhand price really sucks about this watch. You know, at 15,000, it's expensive for sure. Probably still a bit overpriced for a steel sports watch, but at 30,000, I think we've really ventured into crazy town. Downside number two for the modern variant is the polished center links. You know, I would wear this on a strap immediately because I have a strong aversion to polished center links. I love the look of them, but unfortunately I scratch them off to hell. So if it isn't brushed, I'm gonna have to take it off to avoid destroying it. Downside number three is availability. You can't get this in the store. And that's just a fact, nothing more to say there. Like you can try, maybe eventually you get lucky, maybe you're a great client and you actually can. But most of us will put our name down if we really want the watch and we probably won't expect to receive it. Downside number four is the hype. See, some people just don't like something because it's popular. It's like enjoying a band. And then as soon as they get famous, we say, well, they're not as good as they once were. Some people I just identify with the feeling of being a rebel, the feeling of being unique or different. See, I don't have an aversion to that. I have a modern Submariner in my collection, very standard, very expected, but I love it. And I don't care who else owns one. So is the hype deserved? And the thing is, it's hard to call it hype when it's been such a sustained demand since the 80s. Through the 90s and 2000s, this has been one of the few examples of a watch that already had a wait list before any of this crazy watch stuff started. And now, now that there are wait lists for a lot of watches, this obviously has an unobtainium level to the watch. And I think a lot of it is relatively well-deserved from a design element. Sure, there's a lot of demand following demand, and a lot of us watch enthusiasts follow what other people are doing, and we all kind of decide the same things as one another because it's easier, you can be more confident in your decision. That being said, the watch is still fantastic, which is what drove demand to begin with. The sizing is well done, the movement is extremely well executed, it feels great, the other major downside though I will mention has to do with the screw down pushers. It makes them very not useful. I'm not used to screw down pushers and so I had to unscrew it every time I wanted to use one. Wasn't a huge fan of that. 
Also, quick shout out to Moyer Fine Jewelers. Uh, they let me have hands on with these two watches, as well as this Patek World Timer that I'm gonna be doing a review for coming up here soon. So if you're in the indie area or you're shopping online, check out Moyer Fine Jewelers. They've always been so good to work with. So what's the result of all of this, right? It's a fantastic watch, but relatively unattainable from a price and availability perspective. So what if you want a panda style watch with a ceramic bezel, similar design cues, vertical clutch, column wheel chronograph, but you want to keep it affordable and you want to actually be able to buy it. Honestly, look no further than this. This is the Pitsman 3 from a South Korean company and it sells for $1,500. The fun part is while I was wearing it, I wondered how many of you thought I was wearing a Daytona the whole time. Let me know in the comments below. A review for this will be coming soon. But what do you guys think of the Daytonas as well, both modern and Patrizzi or Neo Vintage? Let me know in the comments. Till next time, peace.